Emily Carr's Clee Wick, Chapter 21, Canoe Three red bulls, sluggish, bestial creatures with white faces and morose, bloodshot eyes, made me long to get away from the village. But I could not. There was no boat. I knew the roof and the ricketiness of every Indian woodshed. This was the steepest roof of them all, and I was panting a bit. It is not easy to climb with a little dog in one hand and the hot breath of three bulls close behind you. Those three detestable white faces were clustered round my canvas below. They were giving terrible bellows and hoofing up the sand. Far across the water there appeared a tiny speck. It grew and grew. By the time the bulls had decided to move on, it was a sizable canoe heading for the mud flats beyond the beach. The tide was very far out. When the canoe grounded there on the mud, an Indian family swarmed over her side and began plodding heavily across the sucking ooze towards an Indian hut above the beach. I met them where the sand and mud joined. Are you going back to Alliford? Will you take me? Uh-huh, they were. Uh-huh, they would. How soon? Pretty big hurry up quick. I ran up the hill to the mission house. Lunch was ready, but I did not wait. I packed my things in a hurry and ran down the hill to the Indian hut and sat myself on a beech log where I could watch the Indians' movements. The Indians gathered raspberries from a poor little patch at the back of the house. They borrowed a huge pres preserving kettle from the farthest house in the village. Grandpa fetched it. His locomotion was very slow. The woman took pails to the village tap, lit a fire, heated water, washed clothes, hung out, gathered in, set dough, made bread, baked bread, boiled jam, bottled jam, cooked meals, and ate meals. Grandpa and the baby took sleeps on the kitchen floor while I sat and sat on my log with my little dog in my lap, waiting. When the bulls came down our way, I ran, clutching my dog. When the bulls had passed, we sat down again. But even when I was running, I watched the canoe. Sometimes I went to the door and asked, When do we go? Bimbi, or pretty soon, they said. I suggested going up to the mission house to get something to eat, but they shook their heads violently, made the motion of swift running in the direction of the canoe, and said, Big hully up quick. I found a ship's biscuit and a wizened apple in my sketch sack. They smelled of turpentine and revolted my appetite. At dusk, I ate them greedily. It did not get dark. The sun and the moon crossed ways before the day ended. By and by, the bulls nodded up the hill and sat in front of the mission gate to spend the night. In the house, the Indians lit a, lit a coal oil lamp. The tide brought the canoe in. She floated there before me. At nine o'clock, everything was ready. The Indians waded back and forth, stowing the jam, the hot bread, the wash, and sundry bundles in the canoe. They beckoned to me. As I waded out, the water was icy against my naked feet. I was given the bow seat, a small round stick like a hen roost. I sat down on the floor and rested my back against the roost, holding the small dog in my lap. Behind me, in the point of the canoe, were two Indian dogs, which kept thrusting mangy muddle, muzzles under my arms, sniffing at my griffin dog. Grandpa took one oar, the small boy of six the other. The mother in the stern held a sleeping child under her shawl and grasped, grasped the steering paddle. A young girl beside her settled into a shawl-swathed hump. Children tumbled themselves among the household goods and immediately slept. Loosed from her mooring, the big canoe glided forward. The man and the boy rowed her into the current. When she met it, she swerved like a frightened horse, accepted, gave herself to its guiding, her wolf's head stuck proud and high above the water. The child rower tipped forward in sleep and rolled among the bundles. The old man, shipping the child's oar in his own, slumped down among the jam, loaves, and washing, rested his bent old back against the thwart. The canoe passed shores crammed with trees, trees overhanging stony beaches, trees held back by rocky cliffs, 
pointed fir trees climbing in dark masses up the mountain sides, moonlight slivering their blackness, silvering their blackness. Our going was imperceptible, the woman's steering paddle the only thing that moved, its silent cuts stirring phosphorus like white fire. Time and texture faded, ceased to exist. Day was gone, yet it was not night. Water was not wet nor deep, just smoothness spread with light. As the canoe glided on, her human cargo was as silent as the cedar life that once had filled her. She had done with the forest now. When they shoved her into the sea, they had dug out her heart. Submissively, she accepted the new element, going with the tide. When the tide or wind crossed her, she became, fra she became fractious. Some still element of the forest clung yet to the cedar's hollow rind, which resented the restless push of the waves. Once only during the whole trip were words exchanged in the canoe. The old man, turning to me, said, Where you come from? Victoria. Victoria? Victoria, good place, still. Vancouver, Seattle, lots, lots trouble. Victoria, plenty still. It was midnight when the wolf-like nose of our canoe nuzzled up to the landing at Alliford. All the village was dark. Our little group was silhouetted on the landing for one moment while silver passed from my hand to the Indian. Good night, Quinny. Our solitary speck and a huddle of specks moved across, sorry, one solitary speck and a huddle of specks moved across the beach, crossed the edge of visibility and plunged into immense night. Slowly, the canoe drifted away from the moonlit landing Till, at the end of her rope, she lay an empty thing, floating among the shadows of an inverted forest. The End